Hi, everybody. I'm really sorry I can't be there with you in person today, but I look forward to seeing you all next year in Lisbon. Many of the other presenters today have the benefit of drawing on Mary's dozens of publications on material culture, foodways, urban, and industrial archaeology. But I don't. Caribbean archaeology may have been a constant in Mary's career at Boston University, but her contributions to it are not adequately represented in her publication record or major research projects. What survives of Mary's Caribbean scholarship exists only in gray literature reports, copies of conference presentations, and a few excerpts that she slipped into other publications. For the most part, her Caribbean contributions have become the realm of storytelling. The version of Mary that I came to know when I was her undergraduate advisee at BU in the late 90s was Mary, the island archaeologist. Here's a scene from a Cayley Mary organized to celebrate 4th of July on the island of South Uist in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. It was 1999, and she and Jim Simmons were leading excavations at the Flora MacDonald homestead. That was my first field experience. Mary never billed herself as an island archaeologist in general, or as a Caribbeanist once she started to do field work on Montserrat in the early 2000s. But she certainly could have. By that point, she'd already spent quite a bit of time conducting research on Atlantic islands, from the Outer Hebrides and the Boston Harbor Islands to Nantucket and so on. I'm privileged to be in a position to recap Mary's involvement in and con contributions to Caribbean archeology span because I had a front row seat to it over the past 15 plus years. So in this presentation, I'm gonna flip Mary's own storytelling approaches back on her and try to convey some of the entangled biographies involving the finds, landscapes, and people with whom she worked in the Caribbean and how those experiences left lasting marks in the region and in the discipline. In 2006, seven years after I went with Mary to Scotland, she invited me to join her over winter break on the tiny remote island of Montserrat. I was a PhD student at Brown at the time. She was planning to lead a short week-long survey of an 18th century plantation at Little Bay. Mac Goodwin, who had been her first PhD student to graduate uh, back in 1987, and his wife, geographer Lydia Pulsifer, invited her to join them on Montserrat and to take over leadership of the excavations at Little Bay. Lydia and Mac had spent much of the late 80s and 90s excavating an 18th century plantation called Galway's Estate on the opposite end of the island. In the course of trying to sell me on coming to Montserrat, Mary showed me the map of the seven by three mile island. Her emphasis on the fact that Little Bay was located just about as far away as possible from the Soufriere Hills volcano didn't exactly put me at ease. The volcano had been erupting on and off since 1995 with major eruptions ruining the capital city of Plymouth in 1997 and 1993, forcing two thirds of the island's residents to move abroad and the remaining residents who lived in the South to move northwards. I remember wondering as she was talking about Montserrat to me, where did the cautious, detail-oriented, hyper-vigilant Mary go? And who was this person trying to convince me to join her in the lap of danger? But she assured me that there wasn't a reason to be all that concerned. There hadn't been much volcanic activity lately. After all, she traveled there the previous year with Mac and Lydia to scope out the site. And then she even rode a donkey into the exclusion zone in Plymouth and walked around on the roofs of buried buildings. That conversation should have clued me into the fact that the Caribbean brought out an even bolder Mary. Mary, the adventurous, courageous, thrill-seeking, or some might say thrill-inviting archeologist. If she was up to the challenge, I knew I had no business dithering. And so Mary joined um, Lydia, Mac, and the crew of two, me and Caitlin DeLott, who was then a UMass Boston grad student, uh, for a survey of the Little Bay Estate over the week of New Year's between 2006 and 2007. 
The area around Little Bay was then still quite undeveloped, although all of that was about to change in the coming years because the village was earmarked to be converted into the island's new capital city and government headquarters. As it turned out, the volcano had actually become increasingly active in the weeks leading up to our arrival in December of 2006. And so whenever the winds shifted to the north, we'd smell sulfur and see clouds of ash raining down on the homes in the areas of Old Town and Old Veston along the island's coast where we were staying at a hotel. Mary was only focused at the work, on the work at hand though. As long as she was calm, we carried on. But one afternoon, January 3rd, the emergency siren started wailing. This was an island-wide signal alerting us to heightened volcanic activity. We turned on the radio in our truck and tuned into the island's one radio station to await an update from scientists from the Volcano Observatory. Instead, we were greeted by upbeat calypso music. Rather than panic or grow impatient, which we sort of expected Mary to do, she started dancing and singing, her love for Afropop music outweighing the potential gravity of the situation. Minutes later, the scientists came on the radio and instructed all residents and guests living in the area of Old Town to evacuate immediately because of the threat of a dome collapse. That meant us. Mary wasn't happy about this and she grumbled about the lost work time on site, walked back to her unit and took what felt like forever to finish up her field notes while the rest of us paced nervously around the truck. We eventually made the half hour drive back to the hotel and with the police escort and volcano grumbling in the background, we had 15 minutes to pick up our belongings before we were relocated to a local house outside of the exclusion zone. Mary was remarkably collected throughout the entire process. And in retrospect, I think she even found it all to be a bit exciting. Well, that is until we arrived to our new lodgings and she realized in horror that in the rush to pack, she'd left behind in the hotel refrigerator, the prunes she'd brought from Boston and there was no way to retrieve them. That oversight actually proved to be valuable for her food waste scholarship though. And she was quick to learn a recipe for a local bark based tea that had the same effect as prunes. Discomforts aside, Mary had us back to work at the Little Bay Estate the next day. The estate was a protected heritage site owned by the National Trust. A fence enclosed it and offered a little bit of protection, but just beyond the fence lay the remains of a former enslaved laborer's village. And that area was soon to be leveled for roadway construction. So in our remaining days on the site, we had to gather as much information about that settlement as possible. One would think that the drama of escaping an erupting volcano would ward Mary off from coming back to Montserrat. And she did in fact rush off the island on January 7th to Williamsburg, where she presented the findings of our survey at the SHA conference there. It was a rather straightforward matter of fact presentation. No need for her to highlight the gritty details she thought. What mattered was that the work was done and done well to her highest standards. But of course, the day after she left Montserrat on January 8th, when we were still there, the volcano's dome collapsed in what was one of the most catastrophic eruptions to date. The silver lining of that eruption was that it delayed the construction plans at Little Bay. And that meant there was still more time to recover information from the enslaved laborers village. Three months later, Mary was back on Montserrat, this time with another UMass Boston grad student, Kate Dakota, and also Barbara Heath in tow alongside the rest of us. We excavated for another week and a half and the finds from the village generated enough attention that Mary was able to secure funding for more large scale excavations of the estate. She began those excavations during a summer field season in 2010 and they involved a large crew of current and past BU undergrad and grad students as well as local volunteers. By that point, Mary had established her reputation on the island among its decision makers and the Montserrat National Trust. But at the very moment when she could have capitalized on her success and status, she instead relinquished control, passing the baton of her leadership to her next generation colleagues. 
By the second summer of the excavations at Little Bay in 2011, Mary's then PhD student, Jessica McLean, took over as the director of excavations and the finds from the manor house became the basis of her dissertation on Creole masculinity, which Mary advised. Before that, two years earlier in 2009, as Mary was preparing for the first summer field season at Little Bay, the National Trust approached her and asked if she'd assist them by conducting an inventory of archeological sites in the northern half of the island, the area outside of the exclusion zone. This would involve many pedestrian surveys through all manner of jungle, mountainous and desert terrain in order to locate and document known and unknown remains. As someone who is not always sure of her footing on relatively flat ground, Mary passed the buck to me. And I then launched the Survey and Landscape Archaeology on Montserrat Project, also known as SLAM, with my colleague, John Cherry. Mary's selfless, more the merrier attitude to archaeology on Montserrat was not in step with the culture of Caribbean archaeology practice, which Mary often referred to as a male preserve. The Caribbean also had a bad reputation as a place where researchers tended to be territorial about their work um, on their island and others coming in. There was, this was never the case on Montserrat. Her approach yielded dividends and created an atmosphere of collegiality and collaboration that involved a web of colleagues at all stages of their career who, Mary had, who had Mary in common. We'd organize our projects field seasons back to back, making sure to overlap for a few days with each other. So we had time to share finds, ideas, visit sites, drink rum, and so on. Sometimes we'd even share crew members between projects. If there's such a thing as an assemblage or an ensemble of practice that involves people and a place, this was it. I think Mary found the Caribbean to be an intensely complicated, fascinating, thought-provoking place that touched upon all her interests. To her, it was a region defined by connectivity, not by insular relationships. And she was an expert at making those connections across space, time, and sites. Let me share a quick example. Here we are at the remote high elevation site of Rendezvous Village, an area occupied during the 19th century by free laborers. This is a site that my project team identified and mapped, and we invited Mary up there to have a look and tell us what she thought about the man-made water features, especially the water hole in the foreground here. As much as Mary focused her energies on artifact interpretation, she was also always quick to remind us that site level analysis would never succeed unless one also considered the environs and landscapes of plantations and the spaces in between them. She may have actually been saying that in this photo. But rather than comment on the water hole in front of her, she was scanning the hillsides around us with her x-ray vision, and she detected a series of terraces underneath the overgrown bush that she thought aligned uh, with an irrigation system for the village, and the water hole was part of that. Sure enough, later on, Luke Pecoraro's mapping of the site confirmed this. Drawing on her encyclopedic memory of just about every site she's ever worked on, she then launched into an intra-island comparison with the evidence Barbara Heath had uncovered at the enslaved laborers village at Little Bay just a few years beforehand. Little Bay was located in the valley below Rendezvous. There at Little Bay, one of the laborers houses showed evidence of efforts the residents made to redirect water away from the house during episodes of heavy rain. These land use features piqued her interests in how enslaved populations resolved the predicament of living in extreme conditions. And a couple of years later, when she was on sabbatical in Amsterdam in 2015, she would meet up often with Mark Hauser, who was also there on sabbatical, writing up his work about the island of Dominica. And there in Amsterdam over numerous meals, they cooked up the concept of waterways. And Mark later published about it in Current Anthropology in 2018, and Mary was one of the respondents to that discussion piece. I also want to nod to the fact that Mary left an indelible mark on the field of contemporary archaeology in general and in the Caribbean. In 2003, Mary was one of the founding members of the chat group and the annual conference that year in Bristol, England. 
In 2010, when my project team conducted Montserrat's first contemporary archaeology project at Air Studios, Mary was not only a, an enthusiastic cheerleader, but she was there on island for it. The growing influence of the chat group and the Air Studios project wound up inspiring a new generation of contemporary archaeology research in the Caribbean, including on Montserrat, where Miriam Rothenberg, one of my and John's uh, former PhD students, has just completed her dissertation on four of the villages that were devastated by the volcano. And in fact, that dissertation has won this year's uh, Gilmore Dissertation Award. Over the course of her time at BU, Mary advised upwards of 27 PhD students and served on more PhD committees than I can count. Nearly 20% of her own PhD advisees completed their dissertation research in the Caribbean. Add to this the number of people who she advised as an external committee member, and by my count, Mary contributed a tremendous amount of what we might call invisible labor to shaping the scholarship on many different islands. On Montserrat alone, Mary left an enduring legacy. Among the many students and colleagues who joined her on the Little Bay Project, Several of us have now continued on in the field and have started our own projects there and elsewhere in the region. One of the things I appreciate most about how Mary practiced archaeology on Montserrat and in general was how she brought together different generations of her students, past and present, to work together. I'm sure this was partly by design. I mean, why wouldn't she want to surround herself by those who she trained to operate at her highest standards? But also, from my perspective as a professor now, I appreciate how those students actually really wanted to continue working alongside her. Few of us who worked with Mary on Montserrat were students at the same school in the same program at the same time as one another. And that's true of those of us in this session too. We come from all walks of Mary's professional life, but we have in common the training, mentorship, support, and let's be honest, thick skin, that we received from working with her. I've always considered it a badge of honor to be one of Mary's students. And, and no, that's not really the reason why I made these badges that we wore when she received the Harrington Award in Leicester, but I guess you know that's a nice material metaphor, so we'll take it. To be sure, the camaraderie and the high standards of archeological practice that Mary cultivated among those of us who worked with her are two of her most important and lasting legacies within and beyond the Caribbean. Rest easy, Mary. We're all going to try to do our Beaudry best as we take it from here. Thank you. <laughs>